please help me welcome the Honorable Mayor Richard J. Berry. Thanks, man. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. That's nice. Thanks. Thank you. That's nice. Thank you so much. Jim, I, uh, I hope I'm a better mayor than a guitar player because I suck at guitar. <laughs> but people are nice. We had the charity gala um, this weekend. Maria is here. She puts that on every year. She raised $200,000 uh, for local charities. <laughs> 55000 of that will go to homeless veterans through our uh, Albuquerque Hitting Home Initiative. So a lot of you were, were there. I apologize for the guitar playing. But I want to say thanks for your support. It was a great event, and I think uh, to this point with the, with the galas that Maria has put on, I think she's right around $800,000 that's been raised um, you know, through the last five years. So that's due to your generosity. But Jim and Lynn and everybody, thank you so much uh, for letting me come today and, and talk about kind of bringing some of the ideas uh, that we've talked about over the last uh, couple of months uh, together into one kind of a comprehensive package. But I'm really thankful uh, for all the local support and the leadership that's in this room today and all the support we get for these initiatives. Uh, because we're going to be talking about today the trajectory of our local economy and the efforts being made at all levels, really, by, by local civic leaders, uh, private sector, public sector, nonprofit sector, to, uh, to really make sure that we're on the right, uh, right track. And to our city councilors who are here today, uh, thank you, each and every one of you. Tonight is budget night at the city council. And, and a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about today um, wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for the support of our city councilors because, as you know, they're the appropriators. Uh, we come up with ideas, they come up with ideas, but at the end of the day, uh, we can't do some of the programs that I'm going to talk about today without that support of the city councilors. So I would like you to give them a round of applause. They're so pro-business. and. And, and so today we're going to talk about getting on the right trajectory for job growth, economic mobility, and prosperity. And I want to start here with a slide. And I borrowed this slide uh, from Richard Florida. Anybody know Richard Florida? He wrote uh, The Rise of the Creative Class. I had an opportunity to, to sit on a, or to be on the program with him uh, at the Rocky Mountain City Summit uh, earlier in the year. And this was a graph uh, that he actually had in one of his articles, but I think it really sets an interesting tone for what we're going to talk about today. Uh, if you look at this, um, you're going to find out that there's definite trends. And you can see two upward and one real downward trend. And these come from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and it's their latest 10-year projections. And I know it's kind of hard to see uh, if you're uh, uh, in the back of the room. But what this is, is this is the percentage of our, of our workforce that is engaged in certain activities since 1950, and is projected all the way to the year 2022. And it covers three broad occupational classes, the creative class, the service class, and the working class. And as you can see from the, uh, from the slide, the trend could not be clearer. What you see represented by the purple line, which is the upward line, the lower upward line there, is uh, high-paying, knowledge-based creative class jobs. Those are jobs in science and technology, management, the professions, arts, media, entertainment, most of the folks that are in the room today. As a percentage of the American workforce, creative class jobs went from 15% of the workforce in 1950 to more uh, than a third of, of the workforce today, and the projections are it will continue to, to grow. What the top red line is that also is, is projected to grow and has grown since 1950 are lower paying service jobs. These are jobs in you know, retail sales, food prep, personal care, uh, some of those uh, categories, and that's increased from 30% of the workforce in 1950 uh, to nearly uh, half of all jobs in America today. And then the one that really is striking to me is the blue line, and that's the line that's just taken a dive and flattening out a little bit now, and those are working class jobs. Those are jobs that are represented by factory production, construction, and transportation, and you've seen it's declined from half of the workforce in 1950 to just right around 20% of the workforce today. And these trends are predicted, uh, the last little bit of the, of the chart there is the next 10 years, and they're predicted to, uh, to stay about the same. 
We, we should be adding about 16 million new jobs in the United States in the next decade. Uh, of those jobs, six million of those will be high wage creative class positions. Those are the purple lines. Uh, we'll add about seven million low wage, low skill service jobs in the next 10 years. And we're only estimated to add about 2.7, a little less than three million um, blue collar service class jobs during that same period. So what's happening, and this is, this is a national discussion, what's happening is those jobs that your grandparents and your great grandparents had, that my great grandparents had, that our parents even had, um, those have kind of gone away over the years. Lots of reasons, advanced manufacturing techniques, efficiencies, um, things being you know, built overseas rather than, than, than coming back to the United States. I think it flattens out a little bit because we are bringing more manufacturing back to the United States, and we're certainly working hard to bring more of it to the city of Albuquerque. But what we want to do in Albuquerque is what other mayors that I talk to want to do. We want to create that, those, those jobs in that purple line. It's great to have a good paying job. Service jobs are honorable. Absolutely want to continue to grow those as well. But we want to try to get our share of those other jobs. Because that's where we get economic mobility and that's where we get economic well-being. So and the good news is, and I'm going to talk about this in some fairly good detail today, is that in Albuquerque we're facing this challenge head on and a number of you in this room I'm going to talk about today are really making things happen and I, I really appreciate that. We have a, a very diverse group of local leaders, like I said earlier, from the private, public and the nonprofit sectors uh, who are going to make things happen. And this is why your participation as a leader in this room is so vitally important. Has anybody had a chance? Probably not. But if you haven't had a chance uh, to read this book uh, by Bruce Katz, I recommend you read it. It's called Metropolitan Revolution. Bruce Katz is a fellow with the Brookings Institute, and I've met him on several occasions. I'm going to have him come speak to a group of mayors I put together uh, in New York in June. And he wrote this book. He co-authored the book Metropolitan Revolution. And he puts it this way, and this speaks directly to you in this room today about why you're so important. And I'm quoting Bruce Katz. He says this, the big aha moment the big epiphany, if you will, for Metro comes when non-governmental leaders recognize that they are co-creators of the metropolitan economy and that in many ways they play a large role in governing their communities. And that's through lots of things, investments, just you know, pushing, advocating policy, working with counselors, working with mayors, working with state legislators, but at the end of the day it comes down to making investments. And then he goes on to talk about innovation districts, is what we're going to talk about today, which he describes in his books um, as, as districts fueled mostly by private and civic leadership and finance and the different elements of the metropolitan network that bring their resources together to benefit the regional economy and revitalize the urban core. And I'm going to show you a, a little video here, and I'll start it in just a minute. But, but, but I want to kind of start off with, with this two-minute video to give you an idea of what we're talking about with this innovation district. You've heard lots of parts and pieces. You've read newspaper articles. You've seen, uh, you've seen uh, uh, television reports on it. A couple of meetings ago, I thought uh, you did a great job of talking about the innovation corridor. But I want to try to give you the overall vibe of what we want to create, uh, and then we'll give you some specifics. Take a look at the video. There's a coming center of innovation, a radio mile in perfect location, for living and working in collaboration, for charming homes and modern walks, for famous stores, coffee shops, with restaurants and parks, and theater and arts. Creating a vibe of a city alive, a hatchery, not a chance, a change. Here, a hub of transportation meets hungry minds with education as high-speed fiber zips information to spark insights and inspiration. Where those who achieve and those who aspire are unified by a common desire. To think a thought that nobody's known, so a seed that nobody's sown, and say why not. Artists and engineers, scientists and designers, thinkers and doers, Drafters and signers collide in beehive business formation, producing a wellspring of job creation here at last. Here, new ideas find incubation, technology, commercialization. Here, mentorship and capitalization provide a head start and acceleration. It's an entrepreneurial ecosystem with infinite sky and limitless vision. 
a magnet of growth that attracts them people. To sit at our tables and drink our beer and sleep in our hotels. This is the fusion of the mind and the market. This is where vitality and proximity invite serendipity. To live, work, and play. This is the place. This is the time. In the center of everything comes a center where anything can happen. Innovation Central. You win. We've talked about this ever since I, I, I had an opportunity to be your mayor. And uh, we have to diversify our economy, not just locally, but in the state of New Mexico. We're very blessed to have a robust public sector. We want to fight for that. We want to make sure that that continues to flourish. But we have to start growing our own. Um, Gary Tonzis and his group do a great job at AED of going out and trying to attract businesses to Albuquerque. We're trying to get people to stay here, retain jobs, grow jobs if you're an existing employer. But what almost everybody in the country has realized is we have to start growing our own in this country. Uh, through this national recession, we have realized that we cannot do the same, the same things we've been doing for the last four or five decades. And that's not unusual. I mean, we've had to pivot as a nation economically time and time again over the history of our, of our country. So this shouldn't surprise us. And, and what you just saw on the video is, is really, um, I think, at the heart of, of what the really interesting discussions are uh, around the country. We want to get people together, uh, and, and we want them to create. I showed you a slide several meetings ago where you know, we get a lot of research dollars in New Mexico, and we don't commercialize it, enough of it or as much as some of our surrounding states. That's what this innovation district is about. This is about bringing all these resources together, the thinkers and the doers, bringing the researchers together with the makers, bringing the entrepreneurs and the artists and the venture capitalists and the mentors and the students and the teachers all together and we need to bring them together in a fairly tight radius. And that's what this slide, oops, did I get ahead of myself? Let me go back. I might have been getting so excited I was hitting my button. So, so, the, uh, so, so what you see there are concentric circles out from the first Baptist site, which is, we'll talk about Innovate ABQ in just a minute. Um, but, but that's a one mile radius, and we're gonna talk about why that is important. Uh, and, it's, and I'll talk about it right now. It's important because statistics show us that even though we want development and we want growth and we want activity all over the city of Albuquerque, all over the region, Berlin, Torrance, Valencia, Sandoval County, Albuquerque, we want it everywhere. We do need to have a special place in our metro where we can create a beehive, okay? And we want those naturally occurring collisions to occur between people, and that's what we're doing uh, with Innovate ABQ. And, and some of you, most of you probably have, have at least have some cursory knowledge of what Innovate ABQ is supposed to be. For some reason, I keep hitting, hitting my button, I apologize. Uh, but Innovate ABQ, uh, the blue square, is the first Baptist site. And this is the brainchild of Bob Frank uh, and the folks at the University of New Mexico. We went to um, uh, Gainesville, Florida a couple of years ago and saw what the university was doing, the University of Florida was doing with, uh, with uh, uh, the city of Gainesville. And it was very exciting. And so we came back and, and Bob started driving this movement and since we started on this, we, we jumped in fairly early as a city. Our counselors uh, worked with us. We, we appropriated $2 million uh, to help with the purchase of that site. Terry Laudick and New Mexico Educators Federal Credit Union put $3 million of private sector money into that. Our friends, our county commissioners uh, at Bernalillo County put a million dollars in. Uh, EDA, the Federal Economic Development Administration, put a million and a half dollars in. And the regents uh, of the university saw fit uh, to make this thing happen. And so this is really at the heart of this innovation district. And the innovation district also, if you talk to people around the country, Bruce Katz and other experts, they'll tell you that you really need to work on making this happen in the core of your city. This is happening in Councilor uh, Ike Benton's district. This is in District 2. And, we, and, 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 and the, the Councilor and I have had several conversations, and I think uh, we, we have some really exciting things that we can do. And I think we can actually do more than they did in Gainesville for several reasons. Um, We've got national laboratories here. We've got the University of New Mexico here. And, and the ability to commercialize this, this research, I think, uh, can happen here like really no other place in the country. And right at the heart uh, of this Innovate ABQ will be STC at UNM. Uh, Lisa Kudla is here with us today, and, and she is the director of that, and they are going to put STC at UNM on this site. 
they are the innovation door to the University of New Mexico. But not, and not only do they collaborate with their researchers and the great work that's coming out of the University of New Mexico and other universities, uh, but they, they work with the national laboratories as well. And uh, they'll be the home to the university also, uh, Innovate ABQ will be the home to the brand new University of New Mexico's Innovation Academy. I talked to Bob Frank last night for a little bit uh, about this and he tells me it will be a physical place on Innovate ABQ. It will include academic programs centered on bringing students in the sciences together with entrepreneurship and students in the business uh, arena and putting them under one roof. There will be dormitory facilities, uh, study facilities, mentoring facilities. It will be a place where you can live, study, and work. And so the, the, the new concept uh, of having this Innovation Academy I think is a really exciting prospect. I certainly wish that I was at UNM, I'm a finance major from the Anderson School, got a great education there. Boy, I wish this was around when I was at UNM. I, I really would have tried to take, uh, exam, uh, uh, you know, take full advantage of that. And a couple of that with City Lab, which some of you have heard about, where we have the School of Architecture and Planning already downtown for the last two years. Uh, we're bringing those folks uh, down to the, uh, to the center uh, of the city. In addition to that, what I'm trying to do as a mayor, and nothing is set in stone yet, but I'm talking to individuals around the country and locally about bringing centers of excellence. And they may be on, on the, uh, the blue dot there, if you will, or they may be somewhere within that one mile concentric circle um, of, of, of the core of this, but we want to bring centers of excellence. So we've talked to Paul Homert and his group at Sandia National Laboratories. I've talked to the Secretary of Energy, Moniz, about uh, doing something interesting in Albuquerque. We've talked to Kirby Jefferson, who's here with us today at Intel, about bringing an Intel program. We've talked to the NNSA about bringing a center of excellence there from the Department of Energy. And we're just continually uh, talking to people about coming to this innovation district. Because as a mayor, and every mayor does this, uh, past mayors in Albuquerque and other mayors I talk to around the country, they try to get the secret sauce. What is it going to be that revitalizes the core of your city? Get it healthy so that the rest of your city can flourish and grow from the energy that's there. And there's nothing textbook out here. There's lots and lots of things that go into this. But I've become convinced that between entrepreneurism, innovation, education, and entertainment, if we make those the four pillars of what we can do in the core of our city, I think we have some, some really interesting opportunities uh, to do that. So why downtown? Why would we pick downtown? We, we know that we're going to be making connections to Sandia National Laboratories. We know that the University of New Mexico is within that one, you know, that one mile magic circle, if you will. But there's a lot of reasons uh, to come downtown. And, and I think we'll talk about it here in just a minute. But if we can, but if we can bring these four uh, components together downtown, then I think that's going to drive housing. It will drive demand for retail and office. And it will demand, uh, drive demand for those 21st century amenities that we know that the people that are going to populate this beehive, if you will, this innovation district, are going to absolutely uh, want to do. And I think we've got some other advantages downtown. Um, you, know, you know, why downtown Albuquerque? I think there's some advantages. Uh, we've got great neighborhoods. We've got cool places to live. We've got high-end places to live downtown. We've got more um, austere things for those that want to start up uh, businesses downtown. We have access to, we have you know, world-class boutique hotels. We have some outstanding restaurants with, I think, demand for even more downtown. We've got a great arts and cultural scene in the core of our city. We have proximity to great entertainment venues, National Hispanic Cultural Center. Like I say, there's a, there's a lot of things and a lot of reasons to, to go downtown. And plus, Mike Reardon, who's here with our Department of Municipal Development, uh, just did a study. We have almost 9,000 parking spaces, believe it or not, between the public and private sector uh, in or near downtown. Plus, we're currently in the planning uh, or construction phases of a number of additional catalysts that I think will, will make downtown an even better place uh, to live, work, and play. Of course, if any of you came to the gala the other night, uh, you will see that uh, this convention center is absolutely uh, under construction at this point in time. Uh, that project is a $24 million upgrade. It will be completed sometime this fall. So we're trying to make smart public sector investments that will help drive your investments downtown. Uh, we're going to have some improvements to 4th Street, right, between the Hyatt uh, and the, the CenturyLink building behind it, where we're going to convert it to two-way traffic, put on-street parking, uh, construction starts there in June. That's a million and a half dollar project that came through the geo bond cycle. Also, Dewey Cave is here with us today. Uh, Mr. Cog and the city of Albuquerque are teaming up, and we put in a $15 million Tiger Grant application. 
Uh, TIGER grant stands for Transportation Investment Generating Economic Recovery. Those are federal grants. Uh, this project will be designed, you don't want to go underneath the bridge uh, to, to downtown on Central. There's kind of a physical and a, an emotional barrier there, a moat. Uh, this $15 million um, uh, application for a project will really help uh, alleviate some of that. So Dewey, thank you. you know, we, were, we were smart about how we did this. We decided instead of going after multiple projects, we would all team up between the city and everybody else and go for one big project. I know our congressional delegation is going to be working hard with us uh, to make sure that that comes to flourishing as well. At your last meeting, you talked a little bit about bus rapid transit. This is the next logical step for transportation uh, in the city of Albuquerque. Cities all around us are putting bus rapid transit lines in. El Paso, Las Vegas, um, in Austin, Texas, they're, they're all around us and we, we I think, um, are in a place where we should take a serious look at that. Why? Because the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy, I'm quoting them, say the BRT, Bus Rapid Transit, actually leverages more transit-oriented development in your city than either light rail or streetcar systems. So think about that. Think about, think about bus rapid transit being pennies on the dollar. I mean, literally pennies on the dollar to construct a bus rapid transit line compared to light rail and compared to streetcars. And it, it has a much larger economic impact uh, for your city, according to the studies. Um, we call it a subway with a view, basically. Uh, it would look and feel a lot like a rail system, except it's rubber tired vehicles. They are in dedicated lanes. Uh, they will have signalization authority so that as they go through the intersections, they can change the lights. I mean, it will act very much like a rapid transit system. The, the, uh, the rapid ride buses that we have today um, are nice buses and they do a lot of good things, but that's not even close to being a dedicated lane uh, that these vehicles can go on. So we, we think that uh, this is an important concept to look at. We've been working with the Federal Transit Administration, Peter Rogoff and his group. They built the Acela train. If you've ever ridden the Acela between D.C. and New York, for example, uh, Peter's very high on bus rapid transit. Uh, this, is a, this is a situation where if we can put some city dollars together, and we think the first phase of this may be somewhere between 60 million, or somewhere around $60 million uh, to go for a six mile stretch of this, uh, we can actually leverage at least 50% of federal dollars. So if we put 30 million or 20 million in, we can double that or more with some of the federal, uh, federal monies that are coming in. Bruce Rosieri and his team at Transit and Dana Gardner are working hard to make sure that, uh, that we are in that spot, and we actually just got accepted into the development phase, which means that they think this is a very viable project, and that now we can actually go and start, look at some of these programs like new starts and small starts to actually leverage some of these dollars. So the next step for us, now that we're in the development phase over the next year, is to continue community input, have community meetings, talk to business owners, talk to citizens about uh, BRT, and then decide where we want to put it. I certainly am adamant that if we do it, we want to make sure it crosses the river, connect the east to the west. So if we're going to do a six mile stretch, we've got to decide where we're going to start. Uh, but one of the things that we do know is that we also want to tie in with Mr. Cog and their plans, uh, what Dewey's working on, to run a bus rapid transit line from our airport to the Health Sciences Center at the University of New Mexico. So if we can get this started, we think this is an absolutely uh, wonderful way to spur development, spur economic growth, and also spur economic mobility so that we can get individuals in our city where they need to go. Uh, downtown grocery store, quite a while in the making, but the good news is I think we're going to start construction, or at least the developers are going to start construction on this in October of this year. Uh, this was a public-private partnership. If you remember what we did as a city, we had an old vacant lot behind the Gold Street Cafe. And we had, you know, for years and years and years, we've heard people say, we need a grocery store downtown. I want to live downtown, but I got to have a grocery store. I mean, we understand this. So we, we took that land and basically put it out there as your investment, as a public-private partnership, to uh, see what development activity we can get. Well, um, Paul Silverman and his group, and uh, Yes Housing, Chris Bach is here today, have put together an absolutely fantastic project. What you see there is a rendering of, I think they're going to call it the Imperial Building, maybe. Is that right, Chris? And, and what you're going to have is a 12,000 square foot um, first class grocery store on the ground floor. There's going to be an additional 12,000 square feet of available uh, shop space, if you will, for retail and other things and services. And then the upper floors, there's going to be 74 apartment units. There will be a rooftop garden. And because we ran into some soil conditions issues, uh, they're actually going to put an underground parking garage underneath it to add even more parking downtown. 
Uh, I don't know if Jay Zars in the room, but the folks at uh, New Mexico Finance Authority were uh, really instrumental in this. Uh, they put together a 9% low income tax uh, housing credit uh, that helped make this thing pencil. And as I said, we're gonna break ground uh, in October. And, and, and so what we're doing is we're just adding more and more catalytic projects. And instead of having some overarching plan where we have to wait till everything's absolutely planned out to the nth degree, what I'd rather see as a mayor, do one thing after the other, do the convention center. Do the, do the grocery store, do the 4th Street Mall. Just keep adding and adding and adding. And one of the things that I think is gonna be really uh, interesting, we're gonna take this same model that we used on the grocery store, and uh, I've had some brief conversations with Councilor Benton on this, and we're going to pitch the city council and the, and the business community on this idea, and we'll see where we end up. But the blue dot that you see on the screen is uh, Innovate ABQ, that's the first Baptist site. If you go across our railroad tracks, there's a parking lot. If you drive by there, you'll see it. Uh, the city owns that parking lot. And what we would like to do is to put out an RFP like we did on the grocery store and ask the community and ask those around the country if we put this land forward as a city, if the private sector would come in and help us build a first class entertainment hub right across the street from Innovate ABQ. Uh, we're looking at, as part of this Tiger Grant application, moving the rail, rail runner stop to that location right between the green and the blue. So you could come down from Santa Fe, you could come up from Berlin, you could hop off, go to Innovate ABQ, do your studies, get with the innovative crowd, step off the other way, get a, get a, uh, get a steak, get, get a great New Mexican meal, hear some jazz, hear some music, whatever you wanna do. Most cities have something like this. Uh, very compact, very tight. We would like to see what happens if we can create a premier entertainment hub uh, right there. Of course, across the street, we already have the theaters. Um, we already have Tacano's Grill across the street, so there's some really neat things. And it's compact, and if you notice on top of the green uh, square there, um, there is the city parking structure for the convention center. There's almost 700 spaces there. They're not being used at night. Uh, you could step right off of, uh, right out of your car, walk. Uh, Mike Reardon's working on building a pathway that'll get you right on the ground. And then Rosemont uh, owns the other property adjacent to that, so uh, we'll see if, uh, if we can, uh, have some conversations about jumping in and creating something really special there. We had this land appraised. We actually put a team together. Rob Perry's been leading this for me. Uh, we put a team together to look at this, so we didn't just put it out there not knowing what we had. So we've done some uh, studies. We've done the environmental studies. Uh, we've done some uh, uh, workability studies, some walkability studies. Councilor Benton's really leading the way on a lot of the walkability issues. We've done soil samples, legal issues, trying to make sure that when we put it out, it's, it's, it's as ready to go as we can. Uh, we've had it appraised at $1.4 million, and it is a uh, 1.75 acre site. If you tie it in with the other property, it creates about three acres. So we think this may be another project. If we get the interest, and our job is to put it out there, your job is to come back and tell us if it's viable. If you're interested, how can we make it work? Uh, we made the grocery store work, so let's see what we can do. And I think that would be another great catalyst to help pull people to the downtown area. And as you see, it's also a very compact area. We can work on security issues. We can make sure people are comfortable and uh, come down and have a great time in the core of our city. And of course, the rail yards. And, and, and I want to hit on this briefly because I think this is really one of the um, things within that one mile concentric circle, if you will, that could really be a game changer for the city of Albuquerque. And uh, we put a million dollars into that old blacksmith shop a couple of years ago, and we now have uh, events down there that are being sold out weekend after weekend. We've had symphonic music, we've had uh, MMA fights, uh, we have a, a, a Sunday uh, farmer's market down there that we've had over 5,000 people come to. And, and, and one of the things that I learned early on is on a big project like this, if you can get people coming down, uh, getting their boots on the ground, they're gonna fall in love with the place, they are falling in love with the place. Uh, the folks from Borellis have been great to work with. Councilor Benton has a group that he's put together over the years. I think we're on the front edge of this. Uh, Samatar Constructs is a group out of Los Angeles that was picked as our master developer. They're working with Jim Trump. Uh, I believe we got through LUPS, the, uh, the uh, planning uh, group, and I think this master plan is going to the city council soon, and hopefully by the end of June, we'll have something put together uh, to, to get that moving forward. So all the parts and pieces are there uh, in the core of our city to invent it, to commercialize it, and to produce it, and we think that uh, we would like you to come down and make investments there, obviously. Uh, but we can't just build the district. We can't just talk about all the parking, all the great places to live, all the buildings that we're gonna build. We have to actually fill this beehive. We have to fill this location with great programs, and I'm gonna hit
hit on those for just a few minutes uh, for the last part of my talk today. One of the things I'm most excited about um, is coming from Kathy Winograd, Debbie Johnson, and the folks at, uh, at CNM. And if you remember back to the slide, entertainment, education, innovation, and entrepreneurship. If we can make those the core of downtown, these programs are going to really hit on this. And this stimulus center that, uh, that CNM is bringing downtown does exactly that. It's an accelerator. It's a prototyping and test lab space. It's an entrepreneurial boot camp. It's a coding and cyber security, uh, security academy. And if you look around the country and see cities that have done these kinds of spaces, and I don't think anybody's going to do it better than Kathy and CNM, uh, these are absolutely tremendous places to bring people together who, wants to, who want to be makers. These are driven individuals. They're engineering oriented. They work in electronics, robotics, 3D printing, uh, CNC, advanced manufacturing tools. This is a place to invent. This is the place to catalyze uh, the energy that we have in our city. I've been to maker spaces around the country. I went to one in San Francisco. And you see people in there that are improving their, 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 their circumstances. They're inventing things. They could be simple things. Uh, I think the guy that, that, that invented the square thing that you, that you swipe on your cell phone to read your credit cards, that was made in a, in a maker space. So I know between the, the educational opportunities there, the entrepreneurial opportunities, um, this is a place where you'll be able to sign up. And Kathy, I think I'm right. Anybody can join this. It'll be kind of a fee situation. So you don't have to be a CNM student. I'm going to get a membership because I want to go down. There'll be table saws. There'll be MIG welders, TIG welders, 3D printers. Uh, the ones I've seen have uh, woodworking equipment. They have laser cutters. They have, they have water jets. And people are really coming up with great products and great ideas at these maker spaces. And so I think that's, uh, that's something that is going to be absolutely fantastic and it's going to be right in the core of our city as well. Plus, I believe it's going to bring about 2,000 people eventually downtown. So it's going to bolster a lot of people that are going to need a sandwich and a place to eat and maybe a cold beer after work. Let's see if this flips. Another uh, idea that has come out of Gary Opadal and Bill Bice's um, big brains is uh, ABQID, and this will be a, a, a situation where we're going to take $1.9 million from our EDAX fund. That's the clawback dollars we got from Shot Solar when they closed. We have about $5.5 million in that fund. We're either going to put two, uh, about $2 million, $1.9 million, send it to the city council uh, to start a program that we've seen come out of Stanford, that we've seen come out of Columbia. It's based on the successful Techstars accelerator model where they actually take people who can be entrepreneurs entrepreneurs who have the ability to start a business and then start up businesses that really have a chance to become successful and they run them through a 90-day program and, and they really get to a go no-go decision. Uh, this is uh, being done in over 100 cities around the world right now, tremendously successful, taking folks that have ideas, the gumption, the abilities, giving them some stipend, giving them some resources, running through this, this, uh, this ringer, if you will, and see what comes out at the other end. And what they have found that they have taken the chances of success through a program like ABQID from about one or two out of 10 businesses that actually succeed up to six or seven out of 10 businesses that succeed if you make this initial investment in these companies. So we're going to put $2 million into this program. It's going to happen in the heart of the, of the, of the city. And um, if we can get it through the appropriation process. And then I know for a fact that uh, Gary and Bill are out there right now hustling up dollars in the private sector so that we can say to the private sector, we're putting a significant amount of money into this. We need you also to put a significant amount of money into this. Of course, we've got some other great programs. You've heard about Mission Graduate. Um, Angelo Gonzalez and his crew, Jim Hinton and Kathy Winograd, of course, uh, are, are leading this. Uh, I'm on the Visioning Council. The idea of Mission Graduate is for us to add 60,000 college degrees between now and the year 2020 in the city of Albuquerque. Uh, that's being done in a number of ways. Uh, there, there's five core areas that we're concentrating on, eliminating achievement gaps, increasing high school graduation rates, increasing college and university enrollment amongst our students, increasing uh, college and university graduation rates, and then aligning all of these um, educational objectives to ensure that when people do graduate, they actually have something to do so we can be sticky as a city and keep our youth and our talent and those that want to create right here in the city of Albuquerque. Tall order. But I think uh, if, you look, if you get on the website for Mission Graduate and you look at the Visioning Council and some of the local leaders that are involved with this, um, absolutely fantastic opportunity. Talon Albuquerque is the first of its kind initiative in the country. Uh, this is uh, Jamee Blevin and the Innovate Educate folks. Uh, we are getting national attention for this now. 
What this is, is we have 26 scale-up centers that we've put around the city of Albuquerque. These are in our community centers, they're at CNM facilities, they're at local libraries. Anybody in our city now, yourself included, or your family members, or your friends, or your coworkers, or your employees, can walk in, get themselves for free, tested by ACT, find out where their skills are, find out where they want to be in life, find out where the gaps are, and then we're going to provide them free curriculum through ACT online to get those skill gaps filled in. Then we're going to go out to you, and this is where, once again, all of this comes back to you at the end of the day. We need you as employers to start looking at your hiring practices, and if we can walk in with somebody who maybe can't check all the boxes for you as far as maybe you want a bachelor's degree, et cetera, uh, but if we can show that they have the skill sets, we'd like you to give them an opportunity. We did this at the city of Albuquerque for a year, and we had uh, Vince Yermel, uh, our HR director, will tell you we had tremendous success. We made better hires. We made people, we hired people that fit better into our organizations. And then we, you, can take the time to make those investments, go back to mission graduate, find ways to get them educated. Running Star for Careers, another first of its kind uh, that uh, I want to thank specifically all of the city councilors for this. We, had, we put $200,000 in our budget for this program the year we had to cut $100 million, okay? So our city councilors believed in this program. This is bringing industry-taught curriculum into the high schools. Every mayor wants to, you know, you know, impact education, but none of us run the school systems, and that's probably a good thing. But, but this is a way that we can actually do this. And so we've gone out and we've, we've brought in groups um, to teach 11th and 12th graders skill sets. So they're going to graduate with a diploma in one hand. They're going to come out with a Running Star for Careers certificate in the other hand. The, we have filmmaking. We have healthcare that's running through Presbyterian and their nursing program. We have construction from our friends at ABC, Associated Builders and Contractors. We have hospitality and tourism. We have financial services through New Mexico Educators Federal Credit Union. In the fall through Holman's, we're gonna start a surveying program. And then through Tricor, we're gonna start a, uh, a lab sciences division of this as well. All centered around keeping kids in school, helping them understand why geometry matters, why English matters, why math matters, et cetera. And, and we want to make sure that they also have employment opportunities. So when they come out of high school, and I don't know what the employment, unemployment rate exactly is, but it's probably near 30%, 35% maybe even for recent high school graduates coming out without a college degree. So we want, we want these kids to get a running start in high school, and it's having tremendous success. We're talking to some folks in Washington about bringing some additional grant monies in to, uh, to, to move this forward. This is actually... The first time I ever pitched this program was in 2007 when I was a state legislator, and I pitched it to Dale Decker and a bunch of NAOP folks at your educational uh, committee meeting. And people said, you'll never get this done. You know, the unions won't like it. it you know, it, it, it just won't get done. Well, it did. It, you know, it passed through the legislature. We, stay, we changed the state law in New Mexico. This is something the governor of Utah could, could learn from. When he's here, I'm sure we can learn some things from him. But we passed a law that said you can go in our high schools now and teach for credit if you pass muster with APS or any one of the other 89 school districts in our state. So another core principle uh, of things that we're gonna bring, and then we're gonna try to pull all of this, all the center of these activities into the, uh, into the core of the city. So as you can see, there's a lot going on um, in Albuquerque, centered on diversifying our economy, uh, making a viable workforce, keeping our kids in school, uh, promoting entrepreneurism, and that's what Gary Opadal was hired specifically to do, was to help the city promote this entrepreneurial ecosystem in our city. We're going to commercialize research. We're working on our transportation systems. We're working on 21st century uh, amenities. And we're just really going to try to do this in a way that also revitalizes the core of our city. So we think we're doing lots of things, always more to do. But people are taking notice. And I'm going to hit on this in just uh, right now. If you look at this slide, um, I'm going to talk about living cities. We were just selected as one of only five cities in the country to participate in the, the integration initi initiative phase two through living cities. And a lot of this is because of all the things I just showed you and the investments that you're making. Uh, we were selected along with Seattle, San Antonio, San Francisco, and New Orleans. Now put Albuquerque in that group. And living cities of all the cities that competed for this integration initiative, we were one of the five uh, that were selected. What is living cities? Uh, it's, a, it's a group, it's a collaborative, if you will, of 22 of the world's largest foundations and financial institutions, uh, some of which that you can see on the slide here. In their first Living Cities uh, uh, Integration Initiative that they launched in 2010, they picked five other cities. They picked uh, Detroit, Newark, uh, the Twin Cities, and a, few, and a few others. Cleveland, I think, was in that original group. In the next several years, 
they brought $85 million. $85 million to those five cities. So this is the kind of impact we're talking about. And it's all centered around the things that I just showed you that are going on in the city of Albuquerque. Very, very competitive process. And we just had the Living Cities folks come out and have their first site visit, and they were extremely pleased with the progress we're making. And they were extremely pleased because the business community is at the table with us. A lot of you were there, Paul Homer, Bob Frank, uh, others from the, from the public sector, but we had a lot of private sector leaders there. And that's what Living Cities is looking for. They're looking for people to come, and not just with a hat in hand and say, can I have part of my $85 million? Or, you know, there's no guarantee on that. But they want people to say, what are you bringing to the table? And Albuquerque brings a lot, and that's why they're here. So once again, I think a lot of it had to do with Innovate ABQ, the work that Lisa's doing, Bob Frank, Terry Laudick from the, from the New Mexico Educators Federal Credit Union, putting $3 million of private sector money in. They see a, a really uh, interesting opportunity here. Our first year is a planning year. They've given us $100,000. We will engaging, uh, be engaging a lot of you at the table um, to talk about uh, the core areas that we want to, uh, to work on, which include talent and skill development, uh, business development, capital development, uh, community development, and the development of our entrepreneurial ecosystem. And every city actually competes on a different, you know, it's a free-for-all. You tell them why you think they should be in your city. What we told them was, we want to diversify our economy. We want to create economic mobility. We want to help low-income individuals and families raise their boats. And we want to do it through entrepreneurism which also ties into this whole idea about diversifying our economy. So there's, there's, there's you know, great opportunity here, and those are the five focus areas that, that I wanted to talk about. So we're gonna just be thinking about this. The core of our city, UNM's coming downtown, CNM's coming downtown, grocery store's coming downtown. BRT, if we can get it done, is going to drop you off. We'll certainly do a stop at Presbyterian. We'll certainly do a stop at the university. We'll get you across the river. Think about what you can be doing on the central corridor. But then also think about what kids in middle school, kids in high school, or college students, if you're a second career person, an act two person, if you're a PhD at the labs, if you're a researcher at the university, what, can you, what, what you can do if we can create this, this, uh, this, this beehive, if you will, uh, to help revitalize downtown, but also, um, also just make sure that we have opportunities here so that we can get our share of those high paying creative jobs uh, in the future. I'm gonna bring up a fellow right now, uh, his name, um, is Brian Field, and Brian's from Microsoft, and I'm going to have him give us two or three minutes, if you will, on another initiative that we're going to bring downtown. We've been talking to Microsoft for the last couple of months, and uh, he's going to tell you about some of the things that he's going to bring to the Innovation District to help our kids and our adults uh, prosper. Thank you. Brian. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Great to be here, and uh, I'm thrilled to be here. Microsoft is always thrilled to come to Albuquerque. We know where home is, and it's good to be here. Absolutely. We're happy to be here today, even more so than it's just Albuquerque, but to announce the Albuquerque Microsoft Academic, or not Academic, Dib digital, digital Alliance. This is very important stuff, and it's exactly related to everything that was just shared. There's a digital divide. There's a digital um, economy that is happening in, throughout the world. There's the have and the have nots in the digital time frame. And what we're announcing today and rolling out today is going to help in this area. It's going to bring education for, the, for those that are under and unemployed. It's also going to help uh, with economic upburst with those that are starting companies. And it's going to help bring the science, math, technology, and engineering degrees, what's called STEM, education in the forefront and the minds of the youth of today. So as we look at this, the, uh, the Digital Alliance is focused on, again, education. How can we get more youth focused on those highest paying jobs, the jobs that are in the highest demands? And again, that's STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. Microsoft today, you can go out to Microsoft.com, we have 10,000 jobs open every single day for STEM graduates. We can't find them. And we're not the only company that can't find them. 10,000 jobs open today waiting for STEM graduates that are qualified with the right certificates. What we are announcing today will bring uh, three initiatives to Albuquerque to help with this. It's called Tech Week, Digi Girls, and Digi Dudes. And this is focused on helping the youth get excited around STEM. 
have a desire to get high paying, high quality careers and, and education so that they can be high earners. The second part of this is around economic development and jobs, where Microsoft is bringing our BizTalk technolo or BizSpark technologies into the workforce for companies that are starting out. These initiatives bring ideas and resources to help the entrepreneurs keep moving. We also bring the Microsoft Digital Literacy Curriculum for those that are under and unemployed. Real certificates, real knowledge, real information. 75% of all jobs require basic digital literacy. 75%, if you're missing it, if you're part of that have not when it comes to digital literacy, you are unqualified for 75% of all jobs that are open. And that's not saying the highest jobs, these are all jobs. So with what we are doing, we are bringing those initiatives to Albuquerque. Great leadership, great vision, and we are happy to be here and happy to be part of it. And we look forward from these initiatives at the next Microsoft and the next Bill Gates calls Albuquerque home. All right, thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. Brian flew in from Houston this morning to, to talk to you about this. Uh, we also have Ben Wolves with us today. Ben, ben is with Microsoft, and uh, Roy Soto has been working with us as well. So this is going to happen in the Innovation District. So there's more. I'm talking to people around the country. I'm talking to lots and lots of folks, Department of Energy, other people, just come in here and build centers of excellence uh, in the heart of our city. And I think it's going to continue to, uh, to keep us moving forward. So basically, let me, let me just close by this. Uh, by saying this. I hope you're excited about what's going on. We have some challenges. We've got challenges in Albuquerque. I meet with mayors. I'm in the leadership group now, uh, several leadership groups. I work with Yale University to bring mayors together. Now they, they have me bring mayors together twice a year to talk about innovation, and we do it uh, in New York City. And every mayor, every community, every NAMP around the country is sitting in the same room talking about how can they get their economies uh, sparked uh, after this very difficult recession. We've got a few cities that are hitting it over the fence that maybe took deep dives and now they have some uh, bigger rebounds, but everybody around the country is in the same discussion. And I think we have a chance in Albuquerque right now to basically make a pivot. And we've been working on this several, a lot of these things have taken years to get into place and they'll take years longer to complete. But we have the right parts and pieces in place. I think we have the right leadership in place at the state, local, federal levels to be able to, in the county and others, and at the university and at the labs that really want to come together, put egos on the side, get to the table, figure this out. But go back to my Bruce Katz uh, uh, you know, uh, quote from the very beginning. We have to have that private sector. If we don't have that private sector, uh, we're not going to get anything done. And, and so we're, we're not going to get as much done as we'd like to get done. So I, I see a renaissance for downtown. I see a renaissance for the local economy. And if we just keep meeting these challenges head on, work with us. Coach us along as well as a mayor. And I'll take a few questions if you have time. But just, just keep us up to speed on what your thoughts are. When you see the RFPs come out, tell us where we're hitting the mark. Tell us where we're not. Talk to our city councilors. Talk to us. Talk to each other. And together we're going to get this thing done and we're going to move this city forward. So thanks for your time. Mr. Mayor, great yep. job. Uh, surprised you could keep your breath after all of that. Hey, I was talking like an auctioneer. <laughs> uh, good skills there. Um, what is going to happen with Southwest Airlines and uh, the their ability to fly over Albuquerque. Southwest is making their announcement today, and I and I had my staff give them a call this morning. We've been talking to them for the last couple of months. Uh, what Jim's talking about is a right amendment. It, it expires on October 13th, I believe, of this year. And so everybody, Albuquerque, other mid-major city hub cities like us, are worried about what Southwest was going to do. Uh, we've had our staff fly, meet with their leadership. What we've been told is that from a net standpoint, they think we're going to be in pretty good shape. They made some announcements today. They're not as detailed as possible, but I asked my staff to put a couple of things together. Number one, we're not losing any destinations. Uh, number two, we are actually going to have more East Coast connections with one stop through Dallas uh, than we have today. We're going to have um, new one stop and connecting service through Dallas. So instead of a two hopper all day trip, we can go to Dallas and get to Fort Lauderdale, Nashville, New York, LaGuardia, Orlando, St. Louis, Tampa, and Washington, Reagan. So that's going to be a nice, a nice addition. Right now, for example, when I get back to Washington, 
it, it's, there's good flights there, but it's nice to have another option. Uh, we will lose a little frequency on some of their, on, on, on the number of flights per day. I think we're losing uh, one flight. We're going from eight to seven to Phoenix, I think, in a day. We're going to, from six to five flights uh, to Las Vegas. And we may lose, we may go from eight to six or five to Dallas, but they tell us we may actually have a net increase in seats. Because what's been happening with the Wright Amendment is planes come into Albuquerque 80% full, they stop, and so there's only 20% of the plane to get to Dallas. So they think, or, or Las Vegas or Phoenix, so they think that uh, we'll actually may end up on some of these routes with a net positive seat gain. Uh, we initially estimated, and let's see what, the, what Jim's calculations were, we thought we might lose 15% um, uh, decrease in southwest passenger traffic. Uh, now we're thinking it may be as good as 8%. So it's, prob it's, it's a little less bad than we thought. <laughs> and it, it actually may have, it may, it may actually have some benefits. But also the thing to remember is that we just brought Alaska Airlines in, so we're gonna have a new West Coast uh, direct flight to Seattle. And JetBlue, my good friend Dave Barger that runs JetBlue, and Ann Rhodes, uh, a local rock star, uh, was instrumental in bringing JetBlue. So we have that direct flight to Manhattan. Um, I hear that that flight's going as planned, you know, that their numbers are about where they thought they would be, where they hoped they would be. So may, they may be able to talk to us about San Jose and Long Beach, maybe even Boston at some point in time. So we're just trying to, we've got two new airlines, and it looks like the net effect of the Wright Amendment isn't going to be as bad as we feared, and maybe actually have some one-hop advantages for us. Any more questions? It's one o'clock, everybody's like, let me go, let me go. <laughs> this is a shy crowd. Hey. Once again, um, if you want, if you have a question, I'll, I'll stick around for a little bit too. I'm going to do a little bit of media here in a minute. But uh, good luck to the counselors tonight on your budget. Thank you for your hard work, and thanks for everybody uh, for what you're doing downtown. A lot of you have already made investments. Uh, invest all over our city. Invest in the West Side. Invest in the Heights. Invest anywhere you want to invest. But don't forget our downtown core because I think there's some exciting opportunities for you to come down and and prosper with us. Have a good day. Thanks. Thank you.